This is Mike Paulson with another of my PowerPoint video sermons. Let the Holy Scriptures do the teaching as I rightly divide the word of truth by looking to the Apostle Paul only. Although we still study Genesis to Revelation, what we see applied to us, preached to us, is the books of Paul and a King James Bible. And this is where we present the teachings from the risen Savior, not the Jesus towards the Gospels that was given to the Jews. This is a series presented from the risen Christ to the Gentiles. It's the, it's the goodness of God that Paul presents, not the severity of God that the Gospels present. And this is during the dispensation of the grace of God, which is a term I've come up with is called Paul's Greater Commission, as compared to the Great Commission that goes on in just about all the churches today. And it's a false teaching, but we'll save that for another day. I guess I've got that on my site somewhere else, sorts of teachings about it. But today, we're going to look at that which is perfect. What are we referring to? That which is perfect. Well, we'll get into that. The, the possible answers that people come up with or pastors come up with, well, they say it's Jesus' second coming. And that can't be true, but we'll look at that. It can it be us in eternity. Well, that can't be true either. We'll, we'll look at that. Can it be the King James 1611 Bible today? Yes, it is. And we'll look into that. But this is a, a, a video PowerPoint presentation of that specific subject, that which is perfect. So I open up with welcome to my Bible sermon, Bible study, video PowerPoint presentation. The first half of this presentation, or these presentations, consists of scriptures only. It has always been my goal to help people study and learn to read the King James Bible by themselves. No other book needed, no Hebrew, Greek knowledge necessary, no special history, dictionaries, etc. Are, are necessary. And because so many pastors are so deceitful in their loving yet lying approach, I want folks to realize that they can actually learn to understand the King James Bible themselves without any outside modern scholarly pastoral assistance. The Holy Spirit is all you need to understand the King James Bible. You must always be able to know the difference between God's words and Satan's words. The truth of the Holy Spirit through a King James Bible uh, versus your own good feelings and what your pastor teaches in whatever Bible he so chooses, et cetera, et cetera. In the second half of this presentation, I will include a few of my notes and references and comments I would normally want to mention if I were to teach this particular subject live to any and all who would be wanting to listen. Uh, yes, as you will see, it is still really hard for me to uh, not to stick to my teaching uh, I saw that again here. It's still really hard for me not to stick my teaching into preaching, as well as it equally hard for me to not add preaching into my teaching. I can do a little bit of both, as you'll probably see here. So today's presentation study is a study of the King James Bible being perfect. However, as simple as I believe it is to understand, it seems to be very difficult, if not even impossible, for today's pastors and preachers to understand and teach these verses truthfully. But, that, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. We'll look at all the verses, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 to 14, and we will answer these questions. What is that which is perfect. When is, when and then? To what is in part referring? Is love more important than truth today? How does a Christian grow up? What thing today is the final truth? And finally, what is the significance of these verses today? Once again, and as always in my audio and video Bible sermons, as well as with my many written studies, you will see how important I believe the King James Bible was in history past, still is in today's present time, and will be in tomorrow's future. 
So let's look at the scriptures only. As you will see, you will be reading the simple, the inspired, preserved, simple text from a 1611 King James Bible and nothing else. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 14. Charity never faileth. For whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Then we go down to the next chapter and just look at two verses. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Now let's look at some comments here. I trust you read those words with me very carefully, very slowly, and with great meditation. You can pause and stop and think anytime you want through these things. Hopefully, you were able to discern what God would have you learn from his very words, inspired and preserved, just as he promised. And of course, only the King James Bible has God's promise to preserve his words, by the way. So now as a former pastor Bible teacher, I have some things I would like to say to emphasize and point out that I believe to be comments worth your while. Here we go. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Let's begin with a conclusion. That which is perfect has to be Paul referring to the coming of the King James Bible in 1611. Now let's go on and look at this. It cannot be anything or anyone else. Pastors today say it is just referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ, or some say it's about us in the future. Those who bear only three choices, the second coming of Christ, us in eternity, or the future coming of the King James Bible back in Paul's day. I believe that the scriptures tell us that when Paul was having his face-to-face -face meetings with the risen Christ, he was told about the coming of the King James Bible. All of the past, present, and future, all of life from pre-creation to eternity, were going to be written into a book for everyone to own, read, and study. I believe that's what Christ told Paul. I believe that the coming of this King James Bible was one of the things Paul learned but was told not to utter to anyone when he returned. You'll find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the first four verses. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. He says in Galatians, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So are you ready to see why 1 Corinthians 13.10 is one of the many 
most important and greatest verses one can find only in a King James Bible? Let's start off with a simple definition, the definition of the word perfect. Does perfect in this context mean without error, without mistake, as so many tend to believe? Even preachers of the King James Bible like to use the word perfect when they talk about the King James Bible, but they are only meaning it has no mistakes or so-called corrections. While it is true that the King James Bible does not have any mistakes, nor does it ever need correction, the word inerrant would be the correct word. The word perfect is not the word to use when making those points. Whenever I hear the word perfect being used in that manner from King James Bible pastors, I just wag my head knowing that they have no idea what the word perfect means in that context. Obviously, even those pastors do not even know that words can be self-defined from within the King James Bible itself. Uh, I see a misspelled word there. One of the many features of the King James Bible is that not only do we need not, not only do we not need commentaries, lexicons, etc., that so many lean on for their attempt at understanding, but we do not really even need a dictionary. Although if you want to use a dictionary, a Webster's 1828 is the recommended one because it uses biblical definitions, not like today's weakened, modernized definitions. The King James 1611 Bible will define its own words from context use and what we call the first use method. The first time a word is used in the same context from which we are seeking the definition, a King James Bible will define that word by how it is being used during that first time. Okay, so first, let's look at the first usage of the word perfect in the King James Bible. For that, we look to 2 Chronicles chapter 8, verse 16. Now all the works of Solomon, whoops, now all the work of Solomon was prepared unto the day of the foundation of the house of the Lord, and until it was finished. So the house of the Lord was perfected. We see here that when the foundation was finished, it was said to be perfected. I am sure it was done properly, without other messes and junk, but the reference uses the word perfected, made perfect. So whatever is perfect in 1 Corinthians 13.10 is referring to, it is meaning something has been perfected, finished, not just without error. Fact number one, that which is perfect will be considered finished when it comes. There will be no new, more of whatever it is after it comes. When it comes, it will be done, finished, perfect. It has been perfected. In other words, it has been fixed, rearranged, polished, you know, all that goes on when you work on something to finish it. Haven't you ever, when you were done cleaning your room or whatever, and you got everything dusted, rearranged, picked up, and you looked back into the room and said to yourself with relief in your voice, ah, perfect. Sure you have. You're done. Finished. Now, before we go any further with that thought, let's move on to our second point. In part. For this one, we just have to go back a few verses, verses 8 and 9. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So that which was already existing during the time of Paul would someday fail. Prophecies. To define prophecies is to understand that it means much more than just foreseeing into the future, as folks tend to believe. Prophecies, in the biblical sense, is speaking of spiritual subjects, preaching, speaking, teaching, sermons, etc. Does this mean that sermons are done then? Failed? Nice try, but the answer is no. It means that before that which is perfect was going to come, the sermons, the teachings, etc., had to come from God directly 
either through a prophet, a preacher, a pastor, a teacher, or at times even from God himself through the Holy Spirit, as you read in John 14. That was all going to fail, stop, sometime in the future. That's what Paul's talking about there. Cease. Tongues. Tongues would obviously be referring to what we call speaking in tongues today, not just speaking, period. Tongues was going to cease, stop, when that which is perfect arrives. By the way, speaking in tongues is not just a bunch of gobbledygook that we see going on. That's why Paul had a chapter on tongues. During his day, tongues took place. It's the first part of his ministry, during his ministry. But today, no. We'll get to that in a few minutes. And then vanish away. Knowledge. Was all knowledge going to vanish away? Of course not. But the means of obtaining knowledge directly from God was going to vanish. Stop. When that which is perfect arrived. We'll explain all that as we go. Then it goes on into verse 9. For we know in part... And we prophesy in part. So the third thing we're going to look at is in part. P.S., by the way. Note the time frame of all this. Paul was talking about what goes on during his day, but then he starts talking about something that is coming in the future. Paul mentions that which is going on during his time will then no longer take place when that which is perfect comes, because what they are doing then is only in part. He also talks about his own before and his now time, comparing it to all what is coming and what it will be like when that which is perfect comes. But again, we'll talk about that in verses 11, 12, a little later. Let's just do a quick and early summary and review so far. Those things we read in Corinthians that were being done in Paul's day, prophecies, tongues, and knowledge, will eventually stop, be over. Whenever that which is perfect was to come, then all those things that were being done in part will stop. Those things will fail, they will cease, they will vanish away. In other words, they'll stop. So are you with me so far? Paul is telling those folks that something will come someday that will put a stop to the manner that God is doing those things, in part. That would involve teaching, preaching, speaking in tongues, and having God impart knowledge to them directly from him. So let's take a short look at three possible conclusions. Number one, if that which is perfect is the 16 King, 1611 King James Bible, then it fits all facts historically, doctrinally, spiritually, and it even makes common sense. There was nothing written down that was finished until 1611. Yes, there were many manuscripts, pieces, copies, etc. that existed before 1611. Yes, there were six other English Bibles printed before 1611, but none of them were the finished product. They were not perfected. They were not perfect. Contrary to all the pastors and publishers today, there has never been a need, there is still no need, and there will never be a need since 1611 for any new translation to be printed today, ever. The King James Bible may be 400 years old, four plus, 400 plus now, but it fits today as if it were just written today. Since 1611, as the King James Bible was given out around the world, God has been able to speak to anyone through the written scriptures. Knowledge of and from God vanished away, except within the King James Bible. Tongues ceased doctrinally after 1611. Prophesy from anyone and everyone must come from the King James Bible. How then shall they call on him 
Start again. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And as we'll see, that preacher is going to have to be preaching out of a King James Bible. After 1611, the devil had to start creating all the new Bibles and all of his new doctrines and signs were taught subtly from them. Up until 1611, the devil tried to stop the printing of any and all scriptures. Thus, the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, the time of Inquisition, killing people, torturing people that had anything to do with the putting together of the Bible. No wonder we see pastors, professors, teachers today change and disobey the 1611 King James Bible. The 1611 Bible tells truthful pastors to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. No wonder modern pastors, professors, teachers today also hate the King James Bible. Because the 1611 King James Bible says of the fake pastors that don't use the King James Bible, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. No wonder we see more and more people today who hate the King James Bible. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. And no time is that as obvious as it is in 2020. No wonder God describes the scholars, the correctors, the publishers, modern pastors, just like this in the King James Bible. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. These also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So, what if that which is perfect is actually referring to the second coming of Christ, like some of the pastors say? Then that which is perfect hasn't come, and information would still be in part. Then prophecies with any Bible and anyone would still be fine today. Then speaking in tongues would still be fine today. If, by the way, they were following Paul's rules, it isn't just all this noisy screaming and yelling and gobbledygook going on. Then all that knowledge and wisdom you are feeling and believing in your heart could really be from God. You wouldn't have any specific Bible, so the confusion of hundreds of Bibles and denominations would still be the normal. Then any preacher preaching the love of Jesus from the Gospels or any Bible book, video, etc., creating confusion would still be pleasing to God. Then the books of the King James Bible that Paul wrote could be taken out of the King James Bible. They don't preach out of them. They might as well get rid of them. Then the thousands of changes from a King James Bible to all these hundreds of modern Bibles would be fine, even if all those things that are different, some opposite, some even missing, would still be okay. Then you could be your own final authority as to which Bible, religion, denomination, local assembly, if any, you would want to own. And you could change the different assemblies just because you didn't like their music or the, you know how people are church hopping. It'd be fine. Then you would be able to choose any denomination, local church to attend, even church hop, as I said, and you could base your decision on the music, the worship team, the building, the people, the pastor, how they spend the money, you know, the behavior of the kids, et cetera, et cetera. Then you can actually do anything you want, just confess all those sins later. Just got to make sure you get them all. Then you could be any kind of modern Christian you wanted to be. Then you ladies could be preachers, pastors, rulers in your own home. You could be CEOs of companies. You could be soldiers. 
You could dress, talk, and act any way you choose. Then you would think there is revival going on in America because of all the smiling, loving preachers on TV with their thousands of followers and their millions of dollars and their fantastic buildings. Then you could even think you are born again, not, of course, realizing that you are not quickened and that you are actually waiting for the Antichrist and you're going to be part of the devil's army in Revelation 6 and Revelation 16. That's if Jesus Christ was what that which is perfect has come. Well, that's not going to work. Although I, if those things that you just looked at here, the things that you just read, those are things that are going on in the churches today. I mean, that's just the way people are seeing things. It's pretty crazy what's happening out there. Let's keep going back to this thing again here. And for other possibilities, some folks think that which is perfect is about them, the people, when they get to heaven. Then they will be perfect. That just doesn't really make sense if you read all the other verses before and after Corinthians 13.10, which we will do in a few moments. It would be that we people would be like Paul, living in a time when everything is still in part. One would never have that full assurance and scriptural confidence and would be confessing our sins every day. Well, at least once a week anyway. And here are a few more thoughts on it being the people. There would still be prophecies going on. They would be without the King James Bible's foundation of knowledge and word direction. After all, every modern Bible likes to compare itself to the King James Bible as improved. See? Hey, wait. That is exactly what the pastors and preachers are doing these days. If they use any Bible in their talks at all, they pick and choose some over 400 Bibles. And they all say different things. Because of all that educated scholarship and confusion, they mostly just speak from their loving heart. And if they don't speak much, they replace it with worship music, all kinds of music, which I think some of you have heard me talk about based out of Daniel chapter 3 and the type of Antichrist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, there would still be tongues going on. Hey, wait. There are still people speaking in tongues in churches today. However, they don't follow what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 when it comes to tongues, so it certainly still isn't God's directed way today. And knowledge, it would still be happening, but like everything, in part. Oh, hey, wait. People already think they can only get their knowledge of God from preachers, their pastors, modern apostles, healers, etc., and that they must all have an education from some seminary, college, institute, or worked under some famous big-name personality. Or there are those that think you must even be baptized from the line of pastors all the way back to John the Baptist himself. Are you now able to see, understand, believe that that which is perfect has already come, just like Paul said it would? It came in 1611. And it is still the same today as it was then, just as God promised in Psalms chapter 12, 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Grammatically, them is referring back to the words of the Lord. All the modern Bibles change that to people. He will keep his people. It's just crazy. And when it came, prophecies were done away. And when it came, tongues were done away. And when it came, knowledge was done away. So now you can read from your own 1611 King James Bible and see for yourself that you don't need to say or do fancy prayers, prayer chains, etc. You don't need to have a water baptism before, during, or after and argue about it. You don't need to participate in a daily, weekly, monthly, or maybe yearly holy or non-holy communion, Lord's Supper, in order to commune with God. 
You can see for yourself that you don't need to be seeking signs, healings, miracles, and wonders. Because, by the way, the devil uses those today. You don't need to seek Pentecostal-type gifts from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 instead of Romans chapter 12. You can see that the gibberish, chicken scratch, gobbledygook so-called speaking in tongues today is not from God, and in that manner, never was. You will see you don't need to check for pastoral final approval in your daily personal family life and personal life. You will see for yourself that you don't need somebody to worship for you, no matter where your talent lies, or even if you don't have any talent. You don't even have to go to a local church assembly if that pastor doesn't guide the church according to the risen Savior's words through a rightly divided King James Bible along with Paul only, and that is in Ephesians chapter 4. You can see that stuff for yourself in your Bible. Let's finish this study up now with an epilogue of sorts by looking at the last few verses where Paul compares his days to what it will be like when that which is perfect comes. In other words, what does Paul say it will be like for us today because we are able to have that which is perfect, the very inspired and preserved words of God in a 1611 King James Bible. Okay, let's go on to some verses here. Now to verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child, Paul says. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. If Paul was persecuted, if Paul was persecuted because of what he knew and said, then I am sure he knew what he was talking about when he said, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The persecution that we have today, we have what he knew by having our own King James Bible. And we read it, we study it to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, now let's get on to the conclusion. Basically, what Paul is telling us there, grow up, Christian. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Paul states that when he was young, he was childish because he spake, understood, and thought as a child. Remember, what he was able to give to people was what he had from God, but was only in part. Paul knew he had to grow up. Paul became a man and put away those childish things. Another misprint. Having reading, studying a King James Bible, and of course, rightly dividing it, is what growing up to be a mature Christian is all about. Now we're going to bunny trail just for a second here, because this has something to do with explaining about a child. And we see our children, as it says in Isaiah, to, for to even uh, uh, talking about children, the power children have today. Uh, they're, they're running the show. They're running the families. People are afraid of their children. Total bunny trail here. If kids today would accept the simple fact of what it means to be a child, a kid, a teen, a young adult, and that as their maturity eventually grows, then they will be even willing to put away those childish things it will no longer speak, understand, or think as a child, but in due time. If parents would simply treat their kids like they should be treated, like a child, with little speaking, understanding, and thinking capabilities, then the kids might be better willing to learn better, enjoy their childhood more, and be ready for the maturity to grow. If teachers would only accept and understand what a true child is, 
according to Paul, then they wouldn't have become as frustrated as they have. Today, of course, because of the media and the NEA, all that stuff, they have come to expect from students things that they really are just not capable to understand and think. They really can't. People tend to demand and expect great understanding and wisdom from kids these days, while ignoring the basic fact that knowledge must be first taught and in stages, beginning while they are still children, then to teens, and finally as young adults. Understanding and wisdom comes later as they mature in years and as they learn from Paul in the King James Bible. In the scriptures, there is an order to obtaining maturity and wisdom. Knowledge comes first, then understanding, and eventually wisdom. And what we have going on in our nation today are young people thinking they're full of wisdom. They have zero understanding because they know nothing about what's going on. Okay, let's get back onto the trail. Thank you for the bunny trail. <laughs> Paul said what he said about putting away childish things and becoming a man to make his point, which was, now that we have the very preserved and pure words of God, we can read and study for ourselves. We shouldn't need someone to read it and explain it to us. We can grow up on our own when it comes to spiritual matters, as well as practical biblical application into our own daily lives. Now, I understand there are situations and cases to where some folks still need help, for many reasons, of course. However, one can still simply follow along with their own Bible. When I taught my sermons and, and teachings and preachings and stuff, I just did everything I could to make sure people looked it up in their Bible so they get used to uh, knowing where the stuff is in the Bible. They become more familiar with their Bible so they can read it more on their own more often. And, and as they got older, as they grew in the Lord, that Bible will become something they can just read all by themselves because when we run out of, uh, you know, the freedoms that we're losing here to have your own uh, scriptures taught, you can get it all from God directly, face to face, from your Bible. King James Bible is the only one that works for that. Having one book, that which is perfect, not a library of books and degrees and videos and studies, et cetera, still makes it quite simple for anyone to follow along, to learn from and with the pastor, speaker, teacher, to make sure that what he is saying is true to the scriptures. I don't know how many times I would be at a church service somewhere with my Bible and he would quote some stuff and I go, wait a minute, that isn't what the scriptures say. You've got to have that Bible. Paul even tells us that the purpose of a local church the local preacher, pastor, the scriptures is to help us mature as Christians with our own ability to think for ourselves and to understand for ourselves and apply God's wisdom for ourselves in our own personal lives. It's right in Ephesians chapter 4, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now, this is during Paul's day, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. For now, Paul's time, we see through a glass darkly, but then in the future, 1611 and past, face to face. Now, Paul says, I know in part, but then, after 1611, shall I know even as also I am known. It means it's obvious that's Paul. That's how much we can know what we can know from that Bible. Paul knew the folks in his days didn't see it all. It was not possible. It was only in part. They could see through a glass, 
but not clearly. He says that even he knows only in part. But with that which is perfect, even he would know what he needs to know as well as he knows himself. Paul's use of the word then would certainly be referring to when that which is perfect is come. So folks, with us having the inspired, preserved words of God in our hands, in that inspired and preserved and perfect 1611 King James Bible, to own, read, study, memorize, meditate, understand, seek guidance and comfort, we also should be able to know truth as well as we know ourselves, just like Paul states. Well, let's wrap this up with a little frosting on top of this final dessert with Paul's last verse on the subject. And now, during Paul's time, abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Today, we still have those modern Christians who believe that love, using the word love instead of charity, by the way, they believe that love is most important. And of course, Paul does say charity never faileth. So they still think love is the most important thing in Christianity for the world. However, these loving Christians who use the scholarly corrected word love instead of charity, which when using the humanistic term love only degrades from the true meaning of charity. And for what Paul is saying here, Love and charity are two different words. They're spelled differently with two different meanings and two different applications. But these people today go so far as to say that love is still more important than truth. They pretend to put their own humanistic, unconditional love for all people over whatever God says with his words. They will say to us, no matter what your King James Bible says, I will love and pal around with everyone. Except, you know, they, don't, they won't pal around and accept us, though. So no matter what they do, we're going to love everybody. That's great commission stuff. And it simply is not biblical today by any stretch of feeble scholarly attempt. People that say love is more important than what the scriptures say are missing one simple observation. They missed the first two words of verse 13, and now. In other words, Paul is saying, before that which is perfect has come, faith, hope, and charity abide. And yes, Paul said that charity was the greatest of those three. However, Paul still makes one more comment in the next chapter and first verse. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. Prophesy, or prophecy, which deals with the very words of God, was and is still more important than charity and spiritual gifts. And even now, after that which is perfect has come, then charity will still not be the greatest thing since ice cream, as I, as I say it there. I'll say it again. Because that which is perfect has come in the King James Bible, then today's humanistic love and the Great Commission's false teaching of Jesus loves over all is not the most important element of Christianity. It is, in fact, a very serious false teaching. No wonder the scriptures warn us with these three words. Not three words, but just with these words. Now I beseech your brethren, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned from Paul, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Boy, it's not that they're bad pastors and they're good speakers and they've got great speeches but they're tricking people because people don't have the King James Bible to check out what they're saying, but they go by love and that's all they go by. So there you have it, folks. That which is perfect did come in 1611. That was and still is the King James Bible.
And since 1611, things have never been the same. Just remember, the King James Bible is more important than it outranks and even exposes the Great Commission love and prosperity fake gospel. Scholarship education degrees, Bible Institute courses, workshops, retreats, conventions, books, books, and more books, along with all their kinds of, with their all kinds of music for worship today, is just a bunch of religions. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, Paul says at Mars Hill, I found an altar with this ins inscription. And this fits today exactly. To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. You come along with the King James Bible, teaching Paul's books and Paul's words. You're declaring unto these people that they have, they have no idea about their God. It's an unknown God to them. And you're trying to teach people the living God through the living scriptures, which is the risen Jesus Christ. But people are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth these days. And the truth, that's the King James Bible. That which is perfect has come. I sure hope you have one of your very own. If not, then I suggest you get one while you still can. Because Amos chapter 8 warns us, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. King James Bibles are getting harder and harder to find. A clean, simple text only, no Greek references, no references in the middle, just a text Bible you can hear from God directly. They're getting pretty hard to find. Remember, religion is never the truth. And the truth is never religion. The King James Bible is truth. <laughs>